Hey there folks, Tim Slade here, and welcome back to the ATD Ask a Trainer video series. In today's episode, my special guest Matthew Pierce and I are answering your questions about using video in learning. So stick around. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always loved using video as part of the learning experiences that I've created over the years. And the thing about video is that it's so versatile in the many different ways that you can use it to present information between using live action video, graphics, audio, animations, and even sometimes interactivity. Video gives you the ability to help your learners quite literally see what you're trying to say. But how can you get started with using video in the learning experiences that you might be creating? Well, that's exactly why I decided to invite Matthew Pierce to join me and help me tackle your questions about using video in learning. So let's get to it. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for joining us for this month's ATD Ask a Trainer episode. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Tim. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Yeah. So for those who don't know you, can you tell everybody a little bit about uh, what it is that you do for TechSmith, who you are and what you focus on and all that good stuff? Yeah, so uh, I'm the learning and video ambassador for TechSmith, which means I actually get to do a lot of really fun stuff around training and learning, teaching. So I run our TechSmith Academy, which is a free learning platform to teach people things like skills around video, like creating scripts, storyboarding, shooting video, lighting video, and all sorts of things in between to help people in that space. I also get to do a lot of presentations. I run a, a weekly live stream podcast where I talk to really fantastic people. Tim has been on the show. We've had a lot of other fantastic people that get to share their knowledge, insights, and thoughts. And we just get to chat about things like using video images and kind of the bigger picture around training as it, as it will, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I've been, uh, Ever since I fell into the world of e-learning and instructional design, I just I was very fortunate. My very first uh, e-learning project that I did back in 2009, it was a huge video production, uh, and we had a film crew and all this stuff. And so for me, you know, video in learning and video in training has always been. I've been fortunate enough to to do it, but I feel like now that we're more virtual, uh, people are creating more virtual training and more different types of multimedia. More and more folks are are wanting to. Um, not just incorporate video, but really up the the production quality of their video. So we have some really great questions on that. So you're ready to help me tackle some questions? Let's let's do it. Perfect. All right. So our first question comes from Alicia Vera, and Alicia wants to know what are some of the uh, must have tools for getting started with your own video production. I love this question, and I'm curious to know what your take is on this, um, Matt, because I you know. Uh, I think sometimes people forget, like we have, most people have a video production studio in their pocket, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, you can get started with creating really good, high quality video by using the tools you have available to you. But um, if you want to go something beyond, you know, your iPhone or your Android phone or your smartphone, what is your thoughts on some of those most, or those must have tools that people need to have? Well, I'm an advocate of what you just said. Always start with what you've got because yeah. you're going to make that first crappy video and then you're going to make a second one and a third one. You're going to progress into the tools. It's so easy to go out and spend $1,000 and be like, oh, I can't make a better video. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have kind of three levels of, of areas investment. The first is always audio equipment. Buy a microphone, get something that's going to allow you to get good audio. That's hands down, regardless of what other tools you're using, phone, you're doing screen recording, you're doing a, uh, your web camera, get a microphone. Yep. Next is something that I think is a little astounding to people. It's not a camera. Second is actually lighting. Mm -hmm. Because even if you have a, uh, you know, it's not the greatest camera in the world, your smartphone, whatever it is, lights are going to make a huge difference for any camera. Yep. Uh, smartphones in particular. So if you've got good lighting, it will make it a huge improvement. And then third, if you still need to, you you can go invest in, in in a camera. But in terms of actually capturing footage, there's lots of ways to do that without a camera. Obviously, smartphones are a great one. You've got your webcam. But screen recording is another really good, viable option because you can record things like PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. You can record other things that are going to allow you to create your story or your, your shape your message without you having to be on camera or, or recording a subject matter expert or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, um, uh, my first uh, camera that I ever used when I started doing video for myself was a Logitech webcam. And it wasn't a good webcam, but the lighting really helped make it look better. Uh, that's how I learned that lesson. But the thing about, you know, lighting and audio equipment, you can, 
it's amazing how much of a range there is nowadays. Uh, you oh, can yeah. spend thousands of dollars on a condenser microphone and thousands of dollars on lighting. Uh, the I use a condenser microphone for when I do YouTube stuff, and I got that off Amazon for twenty four bucks, and it's fantastic. Nice. Uh, and same thing with my lighting. You know, you spend a couple hundred bucks, um, and, and you have a whole lighting yeah, this- kit. This doesn't have to be a big investment. I, I think people get caught up because they see the shiny things and they say, like, oh, you know, I use a DSLR camera, but it's taken me a long time to kind of figure out all the things that, that I need to know yeah. about it. And there's so much more I can probably do. But I, I'm a big fan of just growing into that and progressing. And that can get hard with budgets and things like that. But, you know, you can have the best camera in the world or the best microphone in the world. But if you don't know how to use it properly or adjust it or you know, you're not going to get out of it what, what you want. It's like me buying a really fancy car. I don't I don't know anything yeah. about cars. It's right. not going to be, it's not, it's going to be lost on me and I'm not going to, I might grow a little bit, but it's not going to really give me the performance that I think someone who really can appreciate that would get. Yep. Absolutely. All right, Alicia, I hope that help, an, helps answer your question. All right. So our next question comes from Bella Gaten. Hey, Bella. And Bella wants to know, uh, what are the qualities that make uh, a good instructional video? This is a great question. Cause I think, you know, uh, as instructional designers, uh, when people started creating more e-learning, the challenge was it's a different medium, right? You're using all different t- types of multimedia. There's interactivity. And the same thing is true, I think, with video. It's a different type of medium than um, most learning professionals are accustomed to. And so mastering how to make good instructional content with video is different. And so what are your thoughts on that, uh, Matt? Well, I think it's, I like to look at this as like, I I agree with what you said, but in the same way, it's like, it is just another tool in your toolkit of instructional tools. Sure. And so some, a lot, a lot still applies, right. To making good video. Like you need to make sure you have a good understanding of your audience. Mm -hmm. You need to understand, have a good understanding of what you're trying to achieve with this and what you want your learner to achieve. And I think those are different, sometimes different things, right? Like we want them to be successful or we want them, but we want them to be able to do a certain task. And then, you know, for an instructional video, also start thinking about like, why a video? And I'm a big fan of video and I make lots of videos, but like, why does this need to be a video? Is there motion? Is there something that's going to be able to be understood better because you can see it? Um, And so starting to put those things in place will really help you to start uh, making a better video. The other thing I'll say is that when someone goes into the video, here the thing is they can't skim it. It's really hard to skim a video. So a good instructional video, I think, lays out uh, outside of the video even, what is it that they're going to get? What's the relevance to the learner? Why should they watch this video? Why should they invest the time? And then giving them permission. Uh, and, and you can't always do this because there's compliance stuff. And sure. we know there's tricky tricks to this. But like giving them permission to watch it faster, but also giving them permission when they've got the information they need to bail. Like it's okay. Like they don't have to watch all the way to the end right. if, if they're able now to do the thing that they can do. And that, that can be hard because it's hard to track. But I, I mean, without getting into the instructional design meat of it, which we, Tim, we could probably talk for like an hour about, yep. um, I think high level, those are things that I think about. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. Uh, yes. And, uh, and the thing I would add to that is um, I, I love that you mentioned like, why are you doing video in the first place? I, I think the easier answer is to tell people what not to do, like taking a recorded lecture that was a two hour long lecture and just posting that as video is not the right thing to do. Not to say that you can have a two hour video that's engaging, but recording a lecture and posting is probably not going to be the right answer. I think um, the the other thing that that's really important to creating good instructional video content, and this, this kind of intersects with e-learning as well, uh, is, you know, if you have something that you want to show the learner, show it to them, like show them the, you know, show, help them see the things that you're trying to say, rather than just adding bullet points or talking, having a talking head video. If you can improve it by actually showing it, uh, uh, improve the learning, then, then it's going to make that video much more fit for function. Yes. And there, and the thing I'll say, we're just going to keep yes and each yeah. other here, Tim. I, I think you, there's so many things like that, right? Like text and talking at the same time is really tough. There's all these kind of general multimedia rules and there's really great research out there and great books out there. And uh, you can go out and find some of those things, but just start to get familiar with those things because that's going to allow you to make a better piece of content. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is you experiment with what's going to work with your audience because we might say stuff and that's probably generally good rules, but your audience is your audience and you're going to know what's going to re- resonate with them. And so we might say like, oh, you don't need people on camera. You don't need talking heads. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you might be like, no, 
I have a good reason for doing that. And I think that's the other thing is just justify, like have a be able, be able to justify what you're doing. Like we chose to, to put this video at 20 minutes because it, here's why, yeah. or, or we chose to put people on camera and here's why, or we chose not to show anyone's face. So if you can do that, you're going to be in a much better position because then just focus on good instructional principles and they'll apply to the video. Yep. Yeah. You have to be able to justify, you have to be able to explain your intention, right? Everything should be done with yep. intention. Good. All right, Bella, I hope that answers your question. All right. Our next question comes from Randy Keppel. Hey, Randy. Randy wants to know, how do you balance production value and cost with engagement and effectiveness when using video in learning? This is an important one because video can be more uh, costly to produce depending on the complexity of the video you're producing. Uh, and the production can take more time. And uh, then, of course, there's engagement and effectiveness. And I think the the, the crux of Randy's question is how do you make video fit for function, right? Um, mm -hmm. That you're not over investing for something that you're, you know, is is putting more investment in than what you're going to get out of it. So, what are your thoughts on that one, Matt? So, I, I I like this question, and it's it's a hard one without knowing a particular project. Sure. But I think that I often think of sliders, like, and I've got all these kind of things. I've got my analysis, I've got my 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 pre production, I've got my post production, I've got all the things I might need to do. And, and if you start thinking about like video editing, all the, I get all the effects I could add, all the cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about like, where do those sliders need to be? Am I going to crank it to eleven because it's going to be really valuable to do? You know, like add awesome music to this video. Or do I need to pull these things back? And and every video is going to be different, but you can start thinking about this like kind of that scale of, you know, this is going to be internal. It's going to live for about six months. I'm probably going to put way less time and effort into, into that. And so it doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to get the job done, right? It's better done than, than not done. Yep. And then you've got things you're probably going to, you want it to look really good because it's super important. It's got a really valuable and maybe it's going to last for a really long time. So you, you can afford probably to put some more time into it. So you're just going to keep playing with the sliders of things that you do. And, and then you look for the things you can cut out. Like, I think that's one of the problems with video production. It's so easy to add. We're always being additive. Well, oh, I'm going to add this. I'm going to add this. I'm going to add this. It's like, okay, let's pull things out. What don't I need? How can I get rid of as much as possible? Cause that's going to save you time, effort, cost, things like that. So, and there's no, there's, so there's no one right answer. You're going to have to look at the analysis and say, this is why, we think this is going to be worth putting eight hours in or yep. 24 hours or 40 or 80 hours. You know, if, if you and I were making something, Tim, and we we're going to sell it to a, a client, we'd probably put more time into it, right? Sure. If, if we're doing it for just, I'm just doing it for my team, man, I'm just making, I'm turning on a quick video recorder, holding up my selfie style and just saying like, Hey everybody, you know, I went to this conference. Let me tell you about three things that I learned. Like, sure. cause they know they get it. And I think just, finding those balances. And again, there's no one right answer here, but I think trying things out and saying like, can we get away with spending a little bit less on the production and seeing if people respond or are they totally offended by the fact that you didn't add all the effects that you could have added? Yeah, I totally agree. I think the the hard part about this question is it's unique and it's contextual to you and the project and the organization. And there's all these different variables like the shelf life of the content your budget, how many how how many people are going to be viewing this content? Uh, how high stakes is it? What's the potential ROI? And does that at all relate to the production value or the quality? I totally agree with you. I once worked with a client who wanted um, some video for a project I was working on, and they wanted this talking head video with these really intricate animations. But their budget and their timeline was were both really really tight, and so we scaled it back to you know a series of well animated PowerPoint slides that we strung together mm -hmm. with some audio narration into a video. And it still achieved what they were hoping for. It was just more fit for function for their constraints, you know? So it, 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 you have to scale it and figure out what are those variables that uh, you need to consider for the, that project and your organization. Good. Well, I'll just add to that. If you don't mind yeah. that, I, I love what you said about like, you know, you, you had to scale it back. I think sometimes we, you know, we get in this situation if we're really lucky or really blessed in our job, we have like little few constraints, right? But mm -hmm. the, use those constraints to really drive you because you look at what filmmakers do and we don't want us to be filmmakers, but I right. think if you look at those constraints, what you can see is like, okay, this is going to allow me to be more creative and more interesting about the thing that I create because yeah, I can't, I don't have time to pull in the CEO and do a, an eight hour 
you know, full on shoot with full three cameras and things like that. I got, I got one camera, I've got me and I've got to make this as interesting as possible and, and as effective as possible. So lean into constraints and let those help you to, to really say like, yeah, I, I, I can't do this with, I don't have a budget, a hundred thousand dollar budget. I've got five dollars. Right. So what can you do with five bucks, right? Like there's tons of things you can do. You just got to open up your kind of realm of opportunities and say like, yeah, we can make something really good. And how do we, what, what can we pull in to help us do that? Yeah. It's usually the constraints that ultimately require us to be the most creative, which I like. Yeah. All right, good. So our final question comes from uh, Glennis Thompson. Hi, Glennis. And Glennis wants to know, what are some of the common mistakes to avoid when developing training videos? Um, gosh, I could. we could probably talk an hour on this as well. So I don't know. Do you have some top ones, Matt? So the common mistakes I see a lot of people make, and I, I continually make because I just mm-hmm. don't, I gotta, can't get it through my head to learn the lesson, is I usually... Uh, under plan. And I know people are like, wow, we just got to get it done. We got to get done. But planning is such a big part. If you, if you're not planning well, it is so easy to, to get on tangents. It's so easy to, to make a video that is the wrong video. It's so Mm -hmm. easy to get content in there that you're like, oh, but it's such good content. And you're like, and then you're struggling to edit it out because it, you know, you didn't account for it being this part that you didn't need. And well, maybe we'll cut that. Right. Like, so I think one of the biggest one is you got to plan. And I I love to say like, Hey, write a script, (laughs) but I know that's not, everybody's going to do that. So get a good out, get a really good outline, go through and practice the steps of what you're going to show or what you're going to do. And then from there, that planning uh, is really going to carry you through the rest of your project. And if, if you don't spend enough time there, other things just become more difficult, more costly, and much more likely to make mistakes. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Planning is having a really is really an important part of it, d- d- regardless of the scale of the production. Obviously, the larger the production, the more people in, are involved, and the costlier you want to spend more time planning it. Right? I I, mm-hmm. I agree with that. I don't think I have anything else to add to that. Um, yeah, well, uh, the, uh, I got oh, more if you want more basic Well, no, here, here's what I'll say. I'll, I'll, I'll add one more. This is a small one, but it's one that I see all the time when people are scripting video content or audio content. Uh, don't include things like in parentheses or, you know, like you have to script for the way people are going to talk on the video or in the audio. Oh, That's yeah. one that I see all the time. That's a big mistake, but, uh, you know, uh, Oh yeah. Small right. Right. The way you're going to talk is, right is the way you're gonna it's talk, hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Unless that's the way you always write. And then you yeah. get comments in grad school about like, that's the way you're, Hey, did you know you write the way you talk? I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Is that good? Is that bad? You know, another thing, Tim, I think, especially go, kind of, if we look at the thread of com- conversation we've had today, People want to get this expensive gear or this nice gear, but a big challenge I see with video production and learning and development a lot of times is people don't learn their gear. Like yep. they buy lights and they don't know exactly how to set it up. And and there's an artistry to that, but there's a basic set of learning using microphones. I can't tell you the number of times people have come to me like, my microphone doesn't sound very good. It's a good microphone. And I'm like, are you talking into this spot? Right. Um, exactly. So I think just, yep. Learn, take the time to learn your gear, take time to, to be a student, to be a learner, you know, watch, watch how other people make their, their videos and watch, you know, go learn from what other people are doing and, and steal those good ideas and then learn your equipment, learn your, whatever software you're using, learn how to use that so you can get the job done. Cause if you don't do that, you're going to spend a lot of time just spinning wheels and making mistakes and having problems and problems are always harder to fix in the editing phase than they are in the capture phase. Yep. Yeah, I told it's garbage in, garbage out with anything video and audio related. I completely agree with that. And I love that you meant like be a student of this. Like video production is an art and a craft. And um, you know, your video looks great. I feel like my video looks good, but it's it's an it's something that, you know, in order to create good video, I've had to create a lot of really bad video and mm-hmm. misuse the microphone that I bought and the camera and the lighting that I bought. Uh, but that's how I learned to use it. It was just fiddling around with it until I learned how to use it right. Uh, so I, I love that tip. Good. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. So Matt, where can people find you, connect with you online and learn more from you uh, if they want to find you out there on the internet? Yeah. If, I mean, the most popular place I like, I'm still active is LinkedIn. So Matthew R. Pierce on LinkedIn, just search from there. I am on Twitter, but really what I think if people want to learn more about video creation, go to academy.techsmith.com. We've got tons of, it's all free, uh, tons of free content we're, we're releasing. And then I would also just say uh, the visual lounge 
uh, podcasts on your favorite podcasting platform, wherever you are, because we're talking about video stuff all the time. And I'd say 90% of it, 95% of it's applicable to trainers and learning uh, designers, instructional designers, things like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Tim. All right, that's all we have time for today. Of course, I want to thank Matt for joining me and helping me tackle those awesome questions. And as always, a big thanks to everyone who submitted a question for this month's episode. If you happen to be watching this on YouTube and you want to get alerted the next time we publish an episode of ATD Ask a Trainer, make sure to click that subscribe button below. And of course, make sure to check out the ATD Ask a Trainer advice column by clicking on the link in the description. My name is Tim Slade, and until next time, I'll see you around.